You're watching the IIANC Annual Joint Convention from Junior to Jimmy, live from Concord, North Carolina. Um, welcome, everybody, to the start of our convention this year. Um, I'm Nicole Hicks. I'm actually your Young Agents Chairman this year. Um, and just want to remind you before we get started to please turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices that you might have so we don't have any interruptions. Um, you all have a name badge in your packet that you've been given. Um, please wear that at all times. Uh, your family members, children, make sure they have that on as well. That's going to be your ticket into everything that we have going on. So please keep that on you at all times. Um, if you have any questions or need anything, let us know. Um, and while we're talking about that, I want to thank um, Platinum partner sponsor Safeco for those name badges. And at this time, I'm going to introduce Harry Bray, who is our PAC chair for this year and um, let him go ahead and talk with you for a few seconds about PAC. Test, test, my name is Wayne Sumner. It works. Good afternoon and welcome. I'd like to take a few minutes to uh, just briefly discuss PAC and what we're doing and what we've got going on for you to be involved with while we're here at the convention. First of all, I did a lot of thinking last night about what I was going to say about PAC and I think I came up with something original. Um, we all in one form or another are involved in selling insurance and the way I think about PAC is it's a way to ensure our livelihood. We can't all be in Washington. We can't all be in Raleigh. And there's a lot of rules that are being made to, that affect what we do every day. And what PAC does is it gives us access to those lawmakers where we can pick up the phone and call them and they ask us our opinion on what they're doing to regulate us. That's why it's important. That's why we push it the way we do. Um, that's basically all I want to say is it's insurance on our livelihood and I want you to really think about that and if you have any questions please feel free to catch me afterwards and I'll be glad to talk to you a little more in depth. Um, basically I wanted to give you an idea of what we got going on. These orange tickets, these things are going to be all over the place. They are 50-50 tickets. Uh, they're going to be at the registration desk. They're going to be here. They're going to be at the uh, Embassy Suites. They're going to be out at the golf course if anybody's playing golf. Um, and I'm sure I'll have some around if anybody wants any. We're selling these uh, one for $5, five for $20, and anybody that's feeling froggy, 30 for 100 um, Also, we have um, a lot of stuff going on at the silent auction over at the Embassy Suites. We've got things like uh, a Wild Dunes golf package, a Pinehurst golf package, a white, a white water rafting trip. Uh, there is a Richard Petty driving experience package. There's some Hurricanes uh, hockey tickets. And then there's some smaller items like uh, cornhole boards that can be painted professional football, basketball, college football, basketball, however you want them, customized your way. And then there's some smaller items too like golf balls and uh, some die cast cars and things like that over there. That is going to be running uh, tomorrow from 5.30 to 9 and then it will be running on Saturday from 8 to 12 and it will close on 12 at, at 12. So if there's anything you want to get over there and bid on please feel free to do that and we appreciate it very much. The golf tournament, um, there's going to be some opportunities out there. Everybody please bring uh, at least $30, more if you'd like to. We're going to be selling mulligans for $20, uh, two mulligans for $20. And there's going to be a hole out there where you can double your money. It's called Double Up. You can actually wager 10 bucks at the tee. If you hit the green, you double your money. If you miss, Pat gets a contribution. Let's see, did I cover it all? Anybody? Anything else? I think that's it. Like I said, if, uh, if you want to make a contribution, feel free to see me or any of the body in the blue name tags and be glad to talk to you a little more about it. And now I want to bring Nicole back up to take over. Thank you very much.
Um, every year our Young Agents Committee picks a service project and um, this year our service project we have partnered with Victory Junction. Um, we have several things you're going to learn a lot more about them, hear a lot about them throughout the weekend. Um, and we have several events going on um, this afternoon at 6 o'clock, an event starting at Dave and & Buster's and um, several other things that will go on throughout the week. We're raising money, we're taking in-kind donations, and we've also been volunteering our time with them at um, racing events and they are on, on site. So if you have any questions about that, let us know, and you're going to hear Victory Junction probably 50 times throughout the weekend, and um, if you have any questions or want to help, please let us know about that. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize several people that are here with us before we get started. Um, your Young Agents Committee are all in blue badges, so if you guys would stand up for a second. So if y'all have, if any of you first-timers, students, anybody has any questions, please let us know. We'll be your go-to people and try and answer any questions that you have. Thanks, guys. Um, first-time attendees are in yellow badges. Do we have any first-time attendees with us? that want to stand up? <laughs> okay, well they have on yellow badges, so if you see one of them and they look lost and confused, please try and help them out. Um, we have um, Appalachian State students with us and Karen Epermanis and Greg Langston. Um, if you guys would stand up, please. Thank y'all for coming. We also have UNC Charlotte students, um, Tom Marshall and Faith Neal. If you guys will stand up for us. And last but not least, East Carolina University, if you guys will stand up, and Brenda Wells. Is she with you guys? Okay, well y'all can go ahead and stand on up. Thank y'all for coming to you. Um, we appreciate you guys attending and we hope that you have a lot of fun this weekend. Um, at, right now I would like to introduce Jackie Ireland who is our um, IANC chairman. He is going to give our invocation and pledge of allegiance. Good afternoon. Before I do the pledge and the invocation, I'd like to welcome everyone here on behalf of all the directors of the Independent Insurance Agents in North Carolina. And this is a great place. Um, I was uh, attacked by a wolf or a fox. I, th I thought it was a fox, but I th maybe it was a wolf coming in the door there, you know. But um, it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. There are a lot of people out there having a lot of fun. And I see several of my Directors in the back have already migrated over here to the Great Wolf Lob. They're not going to stay at the Embassy Suites, I'm pretty sure. Um, Kelly wouldn't allow that. We were a little bit disappointed that um, uh, we had to stay at the Embassy Suites, but you know, Kelly, he's serious. Uh, you guys got to act your age, particularly you, Jackie, the chairman. You know, you got to act your age, and and so, uh, frankly, I enjoy much more being with the young agents because I was a young agent for a long, long time. And uh, some of the guys I have to hang out with now, just to give you an example, I heard one of them telling a story about a fishing trip he had recently at a pond near his home. And while he was fishing, casting his bait, he heard something so saying, hello. And he looks around and, uh, hello, still can't see anything. Looks all around, finally looks over the side of the boat, and there's this little frog swimming in the water beside the boat. And so he reaches down, rescues the frog out of the water. The frog starts talking to him, says, uh, give me a kiss and I'll turn into a beautiful woman. And the old guy looks down at the frog, reaches up and sticks him in his shirt pocket. Frog looks out of his pocket and says, I told you I'd turn into a beautiful woman. The guy looks back at him and says, well, at my age, I think I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> <coughs> the young agents would prefer to talk to a beautiful woman. That's <coughs> But we do welcome you here. It's going to be great. We're glad to be to have you here at our convention or together because it's going to add so much energy. Uh, you're all a much better looking group than we are. And so we want you to, to, to just uh, feel free to, to spread that uh, enthusiasm and cheer throughout our group. Maybe put a few smiles on the, on the more mature agents over there. Um, let's, let's pray. 
Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have together as a group of, of professionals, colleagues, students, young agents. And we thank you that we can come together and share ideas, share our passion for this business, sharing our altruistic nature, Father, reaching out to help others. I pray, Father, your blessings upon this entire conference. I pray that everything that is said and done throughout would be bring glory to you. And we pray, Father, that you would put someone in our path that we can help today. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, the flag. Dash, are you using that word? Oh, on the screen here. You guys are high tech. So I'll stand, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Maybe seated. Thank you, and have a great week. Now I'd like to introduce our Young Agents Vice Chairman, Carl Sherrill, to come up. He's going to moderate our panel for us this afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, so I know it's, it's a little late in the afternoon for most of us, but I want to make sure everybody's awake. We have assembled a, a great panel today, and I'm looking forward to, and I hope you're excited about hearing what they have to share with us. Uh, and I want to share with you how this is going to work. There's some pads on your table, and so if you have any questions for the panel as we go along, I'd love for you to write those on that piece of paper and just hold them up. We're going to have some people going around that will grab those and bring those over to me uh, so we can read those out so everybody can hear. And then we're going to let the panel speak to those questions as they come up. So be thinking about that. This is interactive, and so we will want your participation. We have a few questions ready for them already, uh, but we'd love for you to come up with some as well. So uh, let's start by letting our panel introduce themselves. Uh, if you guys could each kind of go down the list, uh, we'll start at the end and just give us your name, uh, year, years in the industry. It's, I have in parentheses if you would share, like to share that, but let's have, have your years in the industry. Uh, company you're currently working with, and then what they have done throughout your insurance career. What was that last thing? What you've done throughout your insurance career. Not a damn your thing. Experience. We'll that one yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Dashiell Probst. I've been around a very long time. Uh, before this, what I'm doing now, I was Chief Deputy Insurance Commissioner for Jim Long, and I got smart. It took me a long time, but I got smart and quit that, and now I'm, with John I'm State Manager for Johnson & Johnson. My name is Eric Stevens. I'm with Moore & Johnson Insurance Agency. Uh, my prior life, before getting into insurance, I was a golf professional, a uh, PGA golf professional, and the only people I ever saw at the golf course were doctors, attorneys, and insurance agents. So. Uh, 350 bucks and 40 hours later, you know, I knew what I wanted to do for my life. But um, we had, uh, I've been with Moore & Johnson for eight years now, and uh, I thoroughly love this industry. Uh, I've, I've chaired the Young Agents Committee and worked with great people like Ms. Hicks, who's chairing it now, and Mr. Sherrill, and uh, Mr. Tedder as well, and, and uh, just have the utmost admiration for the peers and professionals in this room. And, uh, well, Charlie, oh, he's still here. But, um, but I work for Mr. Charlie Hoover back there, and so I do appreciate it, but thank you. Uh, my name is George Marcosha. I'm a regional sales director in North Carolina for personal insurance with travelers. And I've been in the industry 20 years, all on the personal line side, uh, in Virginia, Maryland, D.C., and obviously most recently in North Carolina. I'm Ray Tedder um, with bb and Insurance here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've uh, been in the industry 20 years, uh, 1991 uh, graduate from App State. Uh, through the insurance program, so glad to see uh, those folks here as well as the UNCC and uh, welcome to the ECU folks as well. So uh, this is where you can be 20 years later. So, um, I uh, started my career in claims, uh, did that for a little over a year, uh, spent a few years in underwriting, kind of an unusual jump. I've uh, been with bb &T on the agency side about 13 years now and like Eric, I'm a past chairman of the uh, Young Agents Committee, so it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. 
Does anybody have any questions to get us started? Anybody have any questions at all? I have a couple, but I thought I'd give you an opportunity to get us started. I don't see any hands up. All right, keep thinking. I'm going to ask a few to get the get your blood flowing. I'd like to hear from the panel. Uh, we'll start here with Ray and kind of go down the line. If you could share with us in the past 12 months, considering the economy that we've all been facing, uh, what if any changes uh, have you made? Has your agency, the brokerage, or your company that you're with significant changes over the past 12 months in reaction to and then proactively looking forward dealing with the economy? Well, it's an interesting question because uh, I think that depends on the industry in which um, you're in. Uh, I particularly uh, am heavy in construction. So uh, I, in, in 2008, 9, and 10, uh, very slow years. Um, those were the years that the construction industry, depending on residential uh, versus commercial, really started falling down. Um, and the agency in itself has had to make a, a lot of uh, changes uh, to adapt to, to the various uh, industries that the, ver that the agents may be working in. Um, obviously, just like everyone, we're very conscientious of our budget, uh, of our expenses. Um, so we've had to, to cut back and do some things in that nature. But um, BB&T Insurance is a, is a sales organization. It's a growth organization. So uh, the one kudos I will say is even during those difficult times, that's one area that they never uh, cut back on and they realized that uh, the growth, even in the slower economy, uh, was critical. And uh, so uh, they were able to maintain positive organic growth uh, during, during all of the downturn, um, especially your, to your question, the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. yeah, I would say from a, a purse line standpoint, when I moved here in 1993, one of the questions that was asked to me was, did I know what the state tree was for North Carolina? I had no idea what the state tree was, but an agent told me it was the construction barrels, the orange construction barrels. <laughs> Which seemed to make sense because no matter what town I went in, the economy was booming, things were great, homes were selling, cars were selling. Obviously that came to a, a little bit of a halt the last couple of years as well on the personal line side. But the one thing we tried to do with the organization that I work for is just go back to basics basically. When we sat and looked at our plan, where we're going to get the business from, uh, we realized it doesn't have to really be new home sales and new car sales per se. There's still a lot of business out there for the independent agents to go after. And when we looked at the $6.2 billion in personal insurance in North Carolina and the fact that 67.5 is, is controlled by the direct writers on the PI side, um, that's a little bit of the, the action that we took was to go back with our agency partners and to get back to what we called basics. And a lot of agencies actually use that term with us when we ask what they were doing, how they were growing their books, what they were doing from a sales standpoint within their agency. And it was really going back and account rounding their book and cross-selling their books of business, commercial to personal. So, uh, we've been fortunate with our sales staff in place and with a great group of agents. We've put a lot of programs in place that's actually lifted our, our growth in automobile business the last several years in the state. I, I, think I reiterate some of the comments that, that Ray had made from the agency side. Um, yeah, it really depends upon your demographic, your market, uh, what your specialization is, um, and where you're located. Um, we're fortunate. We're in Raleigh, and um, there's still, uh, you know, home sales are are uh, in the Wake Forest market where I live, it went up 3% when everything else was going the other way. So we're a little bit sheltered from that, but some of the, the changes internally that, that we made, um, you know, we looked at our market uh, approach. Um, we tried to be bigger with less, uh, seemed to make sense. I mean, of course, a bunch of producers want every market in the sun, and, um, and we were, at first, it was kind of a, an interesting look, but now I believe it's paid off where we actually know our, um, you know, our RVPs, and we know the folks um, that are the leadership of our companies who we represent. Um, if you have a half a half a million dollars in premium and up uh, with a specific carrier, uh, not saying that carriers aren't listening to somebody beneath that, but it does carry a little bit more weight. And um, so we did some of that. We also specialized uh, a little bit. Uh, our agency has a unique demographic of a long-standing relationship of 40-year-plus uh, accounts. So we were able to experiment a little bit. Um, we targeted associations, designed some exclusive programs that, um, that tended to give us a leg up in a marketplace where everybody else was trying to differentiate and we were different. Uh, so it helped. Uh, it didn't, uh, from a standpoint of being blocked out from a market, uh, we had an exclusive contract with a company so we knew we could get to the, the decision maker and we knew we had a proper market with design coverages. So. So those were some of the areas that, that we looked into, but um, you know, going forward, it, uh, it's a challenging place. And we've been fortunate the past couple of years, but um, it's cyclical. So you just have to kind of keep your you know, thumb on the pulse, I guess. 
Well, from the brokerage standpoint, uh, we've been very, very fortunate to maintain a significant growth over the past five years. And the one thing that I can attribute to that is planning. If we do anything to a fault, it's plan. We plan, we plan, then we plan again. And then we go back and we plan again. But the big secret to planning is to break it down into chunks you can chew on. So we take our annual plan, which is very specific, very measurable, and that's another key, it has to be measurable. And we break that down into a quarterly plans that relate to the annual plans. And then that we relate to a weekly goal and action steps to go back to the quarterly and annual plan. That keeps us on track. And during the year, if we see that we're off the mark, we're not going to make a mark, or we messed up on something, we change it. But that has kept us in the trenches. It gives us a vision, keeps our vision straight ahead, and we've been able to recognize double-digit growth figures over the past five years. Now, about 10% of that's been uh, through acquisitions and such, but 90% of that's been pretty much organic growth. So I would encourage whether you're in the company level, the brokerage side, or particularly the agency level, to plan and plan again and work the plan. Don't let it lay in your desk. You've got to work your plan. Yeah, I would, I would echo that sentiment because that's one thing we've learned at our company as well over the years that, especially like I said when I first came here, the housing was booming, car sales were up, but really strategic planning, it's not something that a lot of folks you know, want to spend time with because you really want to be out there selling, but you got to pull the reins back and we're actually starting our 2012 planning this Tuesday. Um, you know, which might sound early for some folks, but again, if you really want to execute in this marketplace, you've got to put strategic plans in place. We try to keep things simple as well. Uh, on the personal line side at our company in this state, we actually have four things we try to execute on. And, and telling the sales folks, just focus on these four issues with our independent agents. And if we do that well, we'll be successful. Um, one thing I've told some agencies, it's something as simple as account rounding. Basically, you've got one line of business you want to get the other. We've got an 18-step program just for account rounding, depending on how sophisticated an agency is or how maybe green an agency is. And it sounds like that's a lot, but as you get into the plan process and you start to execute and assign duties and responsibilities, you realize, oh, geez, I probably should have done this before I rolled that out. So we've got to go back and incorporate this into the process. Mm -hmm. But that really is the key. It's putting together a very good strategic plan, execution with measurement and follow-up. On that same, just a segue from planning, I think it's important to, you have to be re realistic in planning, and so you have to begin to look forward for your plan. And so I think it would be helpful for us to hear from you guys your perspective and your opinions on where we are at this moment in the economy and where we're headed over the next 12 months. D just an opinion question. Go ahead, Ray. Oh, we're going to start here again? <laughs> I figure we go, we reverse order. Well, we time want, to we think. want to hear from the Why'd you let the draft? Yeah. I'm afraid seats. Keep you on your you feet. Got the it's uh, like the we draft. want to hear from the Buddha first, okay? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Where is my crystal ball? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I think there's so many things that are up in the air right now, uh, particularly with the federal debt ceiling um, and, and, and the questions surrounding that. Um, the trickle I get from, again, putting my perspective from doing so much construction. Um, I am starting to see a little bit of rebound, not necessarily in the residential area. We're not quite as lucky as Eric uh, down in this part of the state. Um, but from a commercial standpoint, one of the, the first two indicators I look for, uh, I've got a couple environmental companies, some drillers, um, doing core sampling, phase one, phase two, uh, and I've got uh, a couple of grading companies. When the drilling starts and the dirt starts moving, that's an indicator to me that, that there's a little bit on the horizon. Um, if you really look back, there was a period of time in particularly late 2008, 9, and early 10 where there was no dirt move. And when no dirt's moving, no buildings are going up. Uh, so from that perspective, um, economy-wise, I am seeing a little bit, little bit of movement in the commercial. Uh, there's a new project here in Ballantyne. I've got a couple of my contractors that were fortunate enough to bid and, and be a part of that project. Uh, it's a, it's a multi-million dollar complex. Many of you are familiar with the Ballantyne area and the offices that are already there. Um, they overbuilt too quickly. They put a freeze on it, and now some of that building's starting back up again. So uh, I think if, if the uh, federal debt situation can mm -hmm. be eased, um, I don't think we want to default on our loan situation. I think that could be catastrophic to, uh, to a lot of folks in a lot of ways far beyond what we could probably imagine. 
but I think uh, some things are starting uh, to trickle in again. A lot of my contractors are telling me they've got backlog, which they've not had for 24 months or so. I think from the perspective that I look at, we, I get access to a lot of market analyst reports. Um, it, it seems to have the same trend that from a commercial standpoint, it's still going to be a slow turnaround. Um, no matter what you read, it seems like they keep pushing things back another six months. Uh, unemployment's still up. You've got the federal deficit, obviously, to deal with that Ray mentioned. Um, from a personal line standpoint, I'm not still seeing a lot of new business construction, residential-wise. Um, there may be some pockets, like Eric mentioned, in Raleigh. But there's still a lot of projects that were started around the state when I go to various states, whether they're outside the metro area or rural, that still have the footings up and there hasn't been a lot of activity on those, on those projects. Um, which again is another reason from a planning standpoint, because we don't have any message telling us otherwise, you know, our continued focus is to still try to cross sell and account around the business. Um, you know, we've seen a little bit of lift in home sales some months with us, then other months have gone back down, so nothing consistent and steady that you get a couple of good runs of months um, at least in North Carolina, and I'll talk to my product manager and we'll look at other states and they'll find the same thing that, you know, we want to look at it just symptomatic for North Carolina for seeing an uptick, or are we seeing this in the southeast or around the country in general? And typically there is no, like I said, consistent growth level uh, from a new business standpoint just from organic home sales and auto sales. We launched, um, we've been doing a lot of public sector, myself and another agent teamed up, and uh, kind of on the other side of the fence, they're seeing the opposite of some of the positives in the private sector, starting to see maybe a little bit of growth. Um, you know, they're under direct scrutiny and uh, they're tightening the belt loops. So it could be a positive, could be a negative, but um, from that standpoint, effective to the economy, it, uh, it's been very interesting to go out and, and deal and work with and, and discuss with folks uh, pertaining to what's going on in their world, whether it be private, whether it be public sector, um, that's one of the great things about being an insurance agent is, you know, you do wear those many hats when you're out in the field. Uh, I think having a level of understanding of that industry and where they're at is critical now more than ever um, to, to really know a lot about what they do uh, so you don't go in there and make some type of statement that could be taken, um, you know, pretty off kilter. So uh, we spend a whole lot of time studying, analyzing, looking at those industries and sectors before we really go and call on them to try to develop them so we can speak their language. But specifically about the economy, uh, seeing a lot of positive things, uh, seeing some contractors again hiring, uh, they feel good. Uh, corporations have buckets of cash. Um, you know, from that standpoint, they've, they've not started hiring yet, but um, a lot of our corporations, what you hear in the news, they, they're sitting on a lot of cash. And I guess inflation would cause them to start spending that. And, and that's when you see hiring turn around. So I think once we get through the presidential election, we might actually start seeing some, some things being done. But a, a lot of political posturing is, is going to delay things until we get through 2012. Well, economy aside, I don't, uh, I'll answer it a little different way. In the upper part of the state, say from the coastal plain from Raleigh west, what I hear is that there is a lack of markets for homes, for homeowners insurance. And uh, if I had a market for inland for homeowners insurance, I probably could retire. I mean, I'd just get calls all the time from the market, particularly with the direct riders. I mean, nationwide is absolutely clamped down hard. Um, so I look at it regardless of what the economy does, as far as our industry is concerned, I'm not seeing any, any change in the standard lines inland. Now, on the coast, we are seeing a lot of movement, a lot of movement, particularly in the southeast coast. Um, I talked to an agent yesterday that wrote five homeowners yesterday. He's written at least 40 in the last month. Well, you may be thinking, that's not such a big deal. But if you priced the coast of homeowners lately, Keith, you'd take five in a day, wouldn't you? That's going to be 10000 plus in premium for those five, at least that much. So that's encouraging. We think it's because the banks are loosened up, turning loose the money, and some folks are beginning to invest a little bit more, buying a second home, maybe buying some to, to take a chance on, they're getting some good deals, and that kind of thing. So we are starting to see some movement on, in the coast. But inland has been, been pretty disappointing for everybody. I think the agents would agree with that. If I'm wrong, let me know. That's just what I hear. 
And speaking about on the personal line side as well, I would like to hear just a little bit if you'd share with us on life insurance, um, the market there, and the way the economy has affected the mindset uh, of that being uh, a need versus a want or a luxury item versus a have to have. If you could share with us what you're hearing from the agencies on that. I do get the bail out of this one because I don't <laughs> yeah, get the personal lines. I'll give you a break, Ray. All I know is that with my help, I can't buy it. That's all I know. <laughs> 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 Charlie Hoover tried to tried to sell me a policy, and even he couldn't afford to pay for it. So. <laughs> and he's got more money than anybody I know. So. It's the height weight ratio. I don't know if we got any life people on the panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for life. Okay. Any questions from the audience at this point? If you raise your hand, we'll, we've got one back here. If we can. Homeowners have had non-related, two non-related uh, claims, uh, which is just a massive rate increase. Uh, one of our companies, Erie, just took 9.9% .9 straight across the board. Nationwide's taken, Travelers has taken. I mean, is this just a segmented hard market that's just going to be focusing on homeowners, or is this a is that a product that's leading to a broader hard market? Or what's your opinion? Uh, my opinion basically is when you, you look at the property loss ratios, maybe the last couple of decades in personal lines on the homeowner side, it hasn't been real rosy as far as profit. Um, the thing I find interesting, a lot of the rate that's being taken right now probably wasn't given consideration with the storms we had this year because those factors obviously were not out there, to, those numbers were not out there to factor into the rates that you're seeing right now. But uh, you're right, a lot of companies are going to consent to rate in the state. There's a lot of volatility in the marketplace. Uh, I can't say from my company standpoint what the position is because I haven't gotten that information yet. There's people a lot smarter than me that basically look at the figures and put that stuff together. I know Dixie Alley is a big term that's now being popped around. It was in the newspaper two days ago in the Charlotte paper. Um, but you know, the last couple years I can say just living in North Carolina and, and again not speaking on the coast, um, I moved down here in 1993 and never saw any hail until a couple of years ago. And, um, and now it seems like in Charlotte, Greensboro, Winston, Raleigh. Um, almost every weekend in the spring, you're seeing a lot of storms. Same thing in Tennessee and Arkansas, which is my RVP's territory. That's been going on for several years there. So I would think that's a trend that's going to continue. And again, if you look at some of the analyst reports and you look at some of the company financials where they actually have the uh, discussions with the investors and they share what their combined ratios are, and for the most part, they're all north of 100, uh, there's a lot of pressure on those companies. It could. I, I just know from a personal line standpoint, there's a lot of things going on in other states with other carriers. Um, you know, Dash will mention some of the direct rate actions in this state. You've got some other companies in the Midwest that are going ACV on roofs. Uh, there's just a lot of claim damage, a lot of dollar damage. Well, it makes a lot of sense there, too. I mean, sometimes some of the states have said the company's giving away a lot of coverage. You know, HE7, everything's covered. Yeah. And there's just been a lot more storms for what, whatever reason or another. A lot of. I I don't think you're going to see it affect the commercial side at all. No, not at all. It's going to stay soft. Yes. It, it, indications keep saying that another six months, another six months on the commercial side. But personal lines, I think, is a different story. And it, it's been that way for quite some time when you look at the returns, especially on the property. You like that? <laughs> Started losing it, turned gray. I figured just get rid of it. But. He's also got a 40 time of 4-4 four, four now. That's not That's right. It turned loose before it turned gray, right? <laughs> yes. And maybe if uh, Ray and Eric, if you could maybe talk a little bit too about what you're seeing as far as the infamous turn in the market. Um, I, I would agree with Dashiell's statement from what we've seen, but we'd like to hear your perspective on where you are on that. It's uh, for, for a person myself who's been in the agency in the industry for not as long as some of you guys. Uh, that to me is an urban legend, the hard market. So we'd like to hear your perspective yeah. on that. Well, workers' comp is, is, is really kind of hit the wall. Um, if you look at the loss ratios on work comp, it, it, companies cannot continue to sustain. Um, ACE has stopped writing work comp business. Uh, AIG Chartist has pulled back uh, several billions of dollars worth of comp. Um, if you guys are out looking in the work comp market right now, you're starting to see, as of April 1st, North Carolina in particular, uh, had a rate increase for many class codes across the board, N not all, but as a general rule, it was the first time we had seen an actual rate increase on workers' comp uh, in the state across the board in, in quite a while. 
Um, so I do think there's some hardening of, of the market in work comp, and I think it's probably going to lead. Um, we're, again, Liberty Mutual, they're, they're, all these articles are out there uh, of carriers that have come forward and said that uh, they're losing money now on workers' comp. So I think, uh, you, you agree with that, Eric, uh, from, I do. from your perspective? For a change, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> so, um, and while I agree with the comments of, of, of Ashel and uh, about the commercial property, um, in the short term, uh, what I am watching are some reinsurance reports. And just actually this week, uh, earlier this week, saw an article in the National Underwriter that if you guys can get hold of that copy, you may want to look at. And it's talking about the loss ratios of most of the, the, the top 50 reinsurers in the world. Uh, and two-thirds, if not three-fourths of them now are running the 115, 120. I saw some numbers in the 150s and 160s. And guys, you just can't sustain at that level. Um, and a lot of that is having to do with the property losses that occurred, both commercial and residential, uh, the first half of this year. If you think about the flooding between the Missouri and the Mississippi, the hailstorms that we've all talked about, the tornadoes that hit the southeast in Joplin, Missouri, uh, and, and Japan. Uh, Japan. Um, I think it's Christ uh, uh, New Zealand. Um, they just had another earthquake like last week or two weeks ago uh, on the you know, 6.0 on the Richter. Um, that's behind the one they had several months before that. Of course, the Japan earthquake. And, and I just think the property's coming. It's not here right now, but I, I wouldn't rule out that if we were sitting here on this panel again 12 months from now, uh, we might be talking a little bit different on, on the property. That's my crystal ball um, from that perspective. I think the only thing I can add is, and kind of speak along the lines of, of Harl is I, I came in and it was just getting soft. Uh, it was about 2003 is when I entered uh, the marketplace, and uh, there was that 2001 9-11 type uh, really short-term hard market and things were pretty well for property and casualty wise um, a lot of agents had pretty you know substantial renewal books and um, so I was able to take advantage of, of some of that where now I mean if you ask a when was your last six month visit like they'll say you only meet six you know every six months or I mean people are are, are just saying we're meeting quarterly agents are on the ball uh, everybody's out there getting it so um, from a standpoint of the market, raised spot on about comp. Um, if you look back, something that I learned this year in looking at loss development, I've never done it before, but taking prior terms and comparing them to current terms and looking at the, the development of specific losses in workers' compensation, it just it make your chin hit the floor. Um, seeing what one client's year looked like in 2008 and, and what that loss run looks like now in 2010. A lot of it is the economy, elderly workforce, they're going back to work. Uh, they're more susceptible to injuries. I was excited to see the uh, the reform that just passed uh, here in the state of North Carolina for workers' compensation to try to redefine suitable employment and cap TTD to 500 weeks and just um, give the uh, carrier uh, an opportunity to look back into medical records and if somebody misrepresented their their self, um, you know, as their medical ability to to do the job at hand, they can actually be declined workers' compensation benefits. So. There's some things that are that are changing in the market, and you just got to be out ahead of it. I mean, you could sit there and read Market Scout and read all these reports, and and everybody's saying one thing over the other. I, I think the big thing is just have a conversation with your customer. I mean, talk to them about what their risk tolerance is. Talk to them about their balance sheets. Ask them questions about what they're going through and understand where they're at. And you can kind of guide the light, you know, through that rocky weather, through the good, the bad, the ugly. So that's kind of the best thing I could say. I'm going to add one thing to that. Um, you guys will watch the work comp over the next 12 to 18 months um, because there will there is going to be a change. The NCCI has come out with uh, publication on this already as far as uh, primary and excess losses. And so for many years, as long as I've been in the business since 1991, uh, that I can remember, primary losses on work comp and the experience bond formula have been capped at 5,000. And then you've got the excess loss factor. Um, they, there was talk about moving that to 15. I think they've settled back on 10,000 now, uh, but I would encourage you guys to go out and, and research that, learn a little bit more about it, because that change is, is right around the corner, um, and, and they're going to start picking implementation dates, and that they've ran some modeling, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact your mm -hmm. clients significantly. Now, they're going to tamper with ballast and D-ratios and other things that get complex within the formula, uh, to try to offset taking the first 10,000 as a primary loss, 
Uh, but in some of the modeling they've done on mod master and some things like that, it's going to impact some of your, your clients' experience mods, um, maybe not so positively. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Any questions? I can ask another question. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I'm going to, yeah, Harry. From a personal standpoint, the bill that was passed in the, uh, the state uh, legislature to uh, supposedly fix the beach plan, was it coincidental that that's when the company started their rate increase, or was that something that had been baked in the cake prior to that, that bill being passed? Uh, with respect to 1305 and the rate actions, uh, you know, it's issued as far as the rate increases that have come across in the state and, and what's being done by companies. Again, it, a lot of it's based on the experience that the companies have had in the past when they're looking into the future, some of its timing. Uh, some companies file their rates at certain times throughout the year. Some go off the rate bureau when they make their changes. Um, I know in, a, in this, the case of travelers, when we looked at the rates for North Carolina, and it goes back before 1305, we just looked at what the potential was for the assessment with the losses, and that had something to do with the rate that we took in the state, absolutely. But I, as far as the other companies, I would think that might be somewhat true. Again, I think what we're, the question Mark was asking a little bit about more than recent storms. I mean, 1305s are past. You know, you can see what your exposures are on the coast right now and what your assessment might be. But uh, like I said, this year, I've, I've been in the industry 20 years and in this state since 93. And I've never seen a year where, you know, we had three, at least in Charlotte where I live, we had three cats assigned three straight Saturdays in a row. I think the last time they assigned a cat might have been when Hugo came through before I lived here. Um, and if you're in Gaston County, it's worse. If you're in, in the upper state of South Carolina, uh, it was bad as well. And, and the unfortunate thing for us is we've got seven cat vans. We had two out in Raleigh for a very short time, so you had to go down you know, to Mississippi and over to Missouri. And Coast is starting to good, isn't it? So, you know, it, you really look at that's, <laughs> that's when you start getting that Dick Sale discussion, so you get hit from everywhere. Uh, uh, here, there's, there's no correlation between the two. They were going to take rate increases, and I, in my opinion, they would have taken the same amount regardless. 1305, um, make no mistake about it, the industry had the ability to know what their assessment potential was before 1305, but just didn't like what they saw. This did give them a little bit more assurance about how bad it could be. But the rate increases were coming. You got to remember, we have a rate bureau that sets the standard rate. Now, if you tried to charge that rate, you couldn't sell a policy. So everybody's deviating. So when they take a rate increase, all they're really doing is reducing the deviation. Yeah, but along the same lines again too, when you look at how the state's set up and you write, you do know what your assessment's gonna be, um, or what it could potentially be, 1305 obviously help with capping that, uh, but there's still a big exposure out there. And, and uh, what most of our agents heard about was the fact that you know you, most companies have a payback period, whether they got a board of directors or the stock goes up, they'll go back and say, you know, if we're gonna be in the state, if a storm hits, it's going to take us X amount of years you know, to recoup the funds. Wait a minute, we got George on the panel, not John Millett. That's today. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that does come into some of the thought when you're looking it at is, your rate yeah. and what, how your position is going to be in the state and what your ability is to be to pay those claims. Just to follow up, is 1305, is that sufficient? Or is there more that needs to be done? Is there anything going on at this point if it needs to be done? There might be a related. If you would, if you believe that abolishment of the rate bureau as we know it is a factor of that, then yes, there is a move afoot to convert the rate bureau to a statistical bureau, and that's probably not a bad thing. The rate bureau was designed to protect solvency back when everybody charged the manual rate, and there was no deviations. There was all dividended at the end of the year if you made money. So the rate bureau was there to make sure there was a rate that would protect the worst company in the state so that everybody had that financial protection. Uh, we pretty much turned our focus away from that, what with guarantee funds and a lot more regulation from a financial standpoint at the Department of Insurance level all the way around the country. So it makes sense that the rate bureau have less of a role in rate making. It is anti-competitive. If you, as a company today, want to come out with a better mousetrap in the personal lines area, you have to go to the rate bureau and get them to approve it. And it goes before their board. Well, 
if you're company A and you're on the board and company Z proposes something that you can't do or don't want to do, you're most likely not going to say, I want to do that. And so the board can say there's not enough interest in that product for us to put it forward. So in that, in that aspect, it is anti-competitive and it becomes extremely expensive because now travelers have to do things different just for North Carolina than they do for 49 other states. So it's, when companies sometimes say we're thinking about pulling out, that's one of the, that's one of the factors they never tell you about is you know how much it costs us just to operate down here because you guys are so different. So I'm, I'm one that said for a long time, the bureau, we need a bureau, but we need a statistical bureau, not a rate making bureau. You know, I would agree with that, and I'd also say even on the auto side, there's also some legislation right. going on on the auto side as well with the facility and the clean, dirty risks, and same thing as far as you know, generating your rate and your bureau rate and, and the cost to keep that up. And, and again, if, for those that follow, knowing how many drivers you've got in the facility in North Carolina versus the other states in the country, and we represent about 80% of the country in the state, so they, there's room for improvement on the home and the auto side on personal lines. Any questions, Carl? Coastal agent living on the coast. Do you see any companies maybe willing to come now back to the coast to write in excluding the wind? Are you seeing that now? In a soft I got you one yesterday. You don't need to ask any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from my perspective, again, from the standard care side, I haven't seen much of that activity. Um, some companies may or may not want to play in that arena. Uh, right now, from our position, we're not doing that at this point in time. I would, ha I would have to agree with that. There, there still exists a phenomenon which I find intriguing. It's called unconscious parallelism. And people in the marketplace will follow industry leaders. So if Travers doesn't do it, if they don't jump off the cliff, then neither is the Podunk Mutual. And it's particularly true when the, they, they look at what the direct riders are doing. And they figure if they're not doing it, it must be something wrong with it. And they, they, people watch all that. So I'm not, I'm not seeing any real interest uh, in standard line markets coming back for property on the coast yes, to, to, to write with wind. Yes, if it was wind. The big player is now not writing any uh, homeowners. Right. The coast. They're pulling out their commercial general liabilities, they're not, they're not renewing all those as well. So well, the real challenge, and th this is where, wh why it's hard for anybody, I think, to say, hey, this is the way it's going to work out. This is the way it's going to be. Because the population is going to the coast. Yeah. Now, ain't nobody trying to get in Nebraska anymore. Everybody wants to live on the coast. Well, insurance companies can't do business. I mean, corn don't, doesn't build a house. Corn doesn't have a job. It doesn't buy workers' comp. People are moving to the coastal part of this country, and they're not stopping. And so it's a big challenge for the industry to figure out how we're going to handle that. You can't just say we're not going to write anything within 60 miles of the coast. You can't say, well, we had a, we had a hailstorm, and we had a drought, and then we had a tornado come through Charlotte, so let's back up to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Next thing, you're going to have an earthquake. And then, so it's a real challenge. I mean, they're struggling to figure out where the hell are we going to go. We've got to figure this thing out somehow. And, so, and it, it, a lot of it gets back to rate again. I mean, if you look at some of the other states, and you, know, you can talk about the John Maletti discussions, but a lot of it, if you can get the right rate and your actuaries think it's a sound rate, they'll go in and they'll write in the coastal areas. We have pretty good success in South Carolina. It's just a different market here. And also models are driving everything. Yeah. And folks, every time they come out with a model, except for one model last year, we look worse. Every single year, we look worse than we did the year before. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the audience? Just want to note, too, if, if anybody asks a question, if you can't hear in the back, if you'll just raise your hand or let me know, I'll, I'll repeat the question for you. I want to make sure you're able to hear the questions. What do you guys really want to know? <laughs> Not you, Jim. <clears throat> you got one back here. <laughs> what advice would you give to a student coming right out of college, coming into the industry? Get your masters. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. 
go back to school until it turns. <laughs> Anybody else on the panel want to take that one? No, seriously. I, I mean, I'm from the uh, in being involved with the young agents and having an opportunity to interact with a lot of the uh, the students that are coming out of our insurance programs and risk management programs here. Everybody is quite focused on the carrier side, and we always tried to pull you over to the independent agent side. Um, but uh, but I think you know taking a hard look at, at becoming an independent agent is uh, I know it, it, the benefit package immediately may, may be a little scary, but you know the, I think Einstein said the most powerful force in the universe is compounding interest. <coughs> and if you can build on a book and keep that thing growing, and if you're motivated and passionate about what you do, you'll be so successful and so quickly. And you have a leg up coming out of college because I'm going to my son's. Uh, a kindergarten class and they're using technology that I haven't used yet and so generationally you have such a leg up on on the group that's out there and there's a big perpetuation uh, gap I would say in our industry and you'd have a great opportunity um, to to really do some things uh, quite quickly but mm -hmm. yeah I would echo that I, I, I you know I think if you don't wake up motivated, passionate, and enjoy what you do every day, then insurance may not be for you. But if you do, uh, and, and you love what you do, and I do, I love this job, I wouldn't do anything else, don't know how to do anything else. So, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the best kept secrets out there. I started on the carrier side, worked my way up to the agency side, but that's not a given. Um, for those of you in the agency side now, find a mentor. Find someone that you trust, someone that has some knowledge, the, the expertise, the experience, who can guide you. Uh, who you can turn to, um, someone that can really hold your hand for a while. Um, you know, work, work very hard. I think one of the biggest mistakes younger agents made, I made, uh, when I got into the business, was um, feeling like you had to quote everything. And you end up spinning your wheels a lot. Um, because quoting is not production. That's not putting money to the bottom line. It's not helping your agency. It's not putting money in your pocket. Um, so figure out the clients out there through pre-qualification that are really sincere about doing business with you um, and folks that you can help. If someone's just wanting to keep their agent, their current agent honest, then walk away. It's okay to walk away. Um, but if there's a real sincere need, and you, you develop that by asking questions. Um, a lot of folks go in, the first thing they want to know is, hey, I'm so-and-so, five minutes of exchange, and then they want to get the policy book, and hey, give me your policy book, and I'll go back and give you a quote. That's the third meeting for me. I want to get to know the people, develop. This is a relationship business. I think I said that earlier. Develop the relationships. Get to know your client. Get to know what they like. Get to know what they need. And, and, and don't sell them. Let them want to buy from you. Uh, I think that's some of the best advice that uh, a gentleman that ended up mentoring me once I got to the agency side gave me, and, and it, it holds true today. I don't, I, I'm sorry. I, would, I just want to jump into on the mentoring side. We do that at our firm, and it... It, it's helped me. Uh, anytime I needed a question answered, I got it. And I got the right answer. And I would ask everybody under the sun. But find whatever it is, carrier, uh, if you're going to a brokerage, if you're going to an agency side, make sure that you're in a group that wants to help and educate you. Uh, and it's not like a me society where everybody's focused on themselves. Yeah, I think what you, both of you guys said too, passion is the key. I think it is with anything. I think the one great thing about insurance is nothing can happen without it. So whether you want to own a business, go to work somewhere, build something, ship something, there's got to be insurance. Not many folks I know go out into the personal line side uh, from college, but we have had, a, have had a few people going to the agency side directly from college, mainly doing uh, account rounding on personal lines, which may not sound that exciting. But again, echoing what Ray said, uh, I think sometimes and I've told agencies this, if you, if you can go out and hire young people that are passionate, enthusiastic, and I hate to use the word jaded, but they're not jaded, um, and you really come across as wanting to help that individual and you're reviewing their policy and looking at their coverages, there's a lot of scary stuff out there. There's a lot of smart people that I've run across that interact with very powerful people who have absolutely horrible insurance coverage. Um, and, and it's not all about price. It really is about getting that person to understand what they currently have and what those gaps are and understanding what they can do with you to really correct what they need and get the right coverage and they'll become an advocate for you. So whether it's on the personal side or commercial, you can still make a great living. You know, again, it's not all about price. If it was, there'd only be a handful of companies out there. Um, it really is, if you can get that relationship built, 
and get that trust, um, especially again on the PI side, if you are going to be routing out a book of business or cross-selling a book where they've already got a time with the agency. Uh, the, I've done this myself and the people really appreciate it. It goes a long way. And it, it's a very small industry. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll close from what I want to say on, on what you said, that I go home every day and, and yes, the money's good and, and I love what I do and I'm passionate, but every night I know I've helped somebody. I've helped secure their assets, I've helped their business. I've helped somebody solve a problem. I look at myself as much of a problem solver as anything because without problems, people don't need me. And uh, so that's the self-satisfaction I get, and that's good enough for me to know that I've helped someone else secure their business, secure their livelihood, so that they can provide for their family. And in the meantime, if I make a little money doing it, that's okay too, because I've got, I've got to provide for mine. Um, but it's, 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 very, it's a very good feeling. And everybody's different, but, but that's, that's where I live in this world. And, and if you don't want to sell, educate. You should. Same I'm going to say so. <laughs> for, the, for the young kids thinking about getting into insurance or banking, or what, you know, Tom Archel and I, when we've got into this business, they'd invent electricity. They just hadn't figured out what to do with it yet. And, uh, but the industry, I can assure you this. I chose insurance. I'm so glad I didn't choose banking. I think it's a much more secure industry. I think it's more fun. It's not cookie cutter like the banking side is, even though they're both financially related businesses. And I can assure you, if some of these old guys like myself around the room have got beards and stuff on them, they, if they told you the truth, they would tell you this industry is much stronger today from every aspect than it ever has been, and particularly the agency force. When I came along, we were worried about perpetuation. That's just a fancy word. It means who's going to take over when these old geezers die. And we looked around at ourselves and said, we don't, we don't think we're good enough to do it. I can tell you the group that's coming along behind us is stronger than we were. So and you're coming in right behind that group. So. It's, it's, it's a very perpetuating business, it's a very strong business, whether you're on the retail side or the company side or the, or the wholesale brokerage side. So I would encourage you to, to look long and hard before you do something different than that. One of the things that was recently just mentioned on the panel too was a little bit about technology and students as you have an advantage on most of us uh, coming out with the newest technology. Uh, I would like to have the panel share with us some of the new technologies that are out there that they're using uh, both from a social media standpoint and then also any specific technology uh, that you've been using within your agency to, to gain advantage and to attract new and retain clients. You want trade secrets, huh? That's right. I'll, I honestly would like to hear Carl um, speak about it. I'll be honest with you because I, um, I linked in with Carl and he's very dynamic at it. Um, I, I think you're great at it. I think you do a wonderful job. Uh, I'm dead serious. Thank you. Um, Welcome to the and uh, you know, I'm moderating by the yeah. way. But next time. <laughs> but, honestly, I mean, you. I would, lies on you, buddy. <laughs> I'd like. I think you do a great job at that. Uh, well, Michelle, I was supposed to moderate, but. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, I won't get into it. You can follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn or however you want to get in touch with me online, but um, and you can kind of see for yourself. But I will tell you that, that my, my strategy is that at the end of the day, it's very little time. Most of the stuff is free. Um, so the, the negative side of it is I, I don't see one other than a little bit of time. And so if you, if you have time at night, I've got three little ones. My wife goes to bed early and the kids are going early. I'm kind of up by myself, so I kind of get the computer out and do a little work. So it, it doesn't take a lot of time to get out there, and, and my take is no expense, a little bit of my time, and if I can turn a couple people, make a couple connections, um, it, it's a win-win with, with no expense. And I, I will say that LinkedIn is, for you students already, you, I think you get introduced to it long before I ever knew what it was, but uh, if you're not on it now, I'd go ahead and develop a page there begin to reach out to people and company folks, you'll be surprised as you build connections on there how quickly you'll be connected to somebody that you might be interviewing with, that you may want to get a job with, uh, and, and all of a sudden now you have somebody that can give you a, a connection and give you a referral in uh, in this environment, in this economy, with relationships the way they are. Um, referrals are gold. They always have been, even more so today. And so I think LinkedIn would be my advice Twitter, I think everybody's still trying to figure that out. Um, so, you know, I'm including myself, but uh, LinkedIn is, is probably the biggest bang for your buck. Keep your LinkedIn and your Facebook separate, especially students, but also <laughs> also some of the younger agents and, and others. Uh, just, just try to maintain a real wall of separation there. It's perfectly fine to have a wonderful social life, 
but those things are checked and people do look for those and so anything you put online um, it, it's out there so yeah I'd like to add to that it's fair game be, be careful guys because um, people have been denied jobs because of what they had on Facebook you guys know that um, but uh, just just be careful about how much of your life you put out there uh, for everybody to see um, because it's available and, and interviewers are, are looking at that stuff and it can harm you uh, severely. Um, I also want to add that, that uh, I'm still a big believer, although I'm using a little bit of LinkedIn and some of the social networks, um, I'm still a big believer, and I said this earlier, this is a relationship business. Don't get too caught up that your only avenue of relationship is through some social media force. There's still a strong value in our business for a face-to-face -face relationship, for a pick up the phone and call. Um, you know, my, my, I get in the car, I drive, I see people face to face, I call them, uh, and I email. And in, in, in that order, I believe for what I do, particularly uh, handling large commercial risks, um, I've got to know the people, they've got to know me. It's got to be a trusted advisor relationship. And you can strengthen a trusted advisor relationship through some social media things, mm -hmm. but I don't think you're going to develop it. So don't lose sight of the face to face pick up the phone and maintain that relationship. And if that sounds old fashioned, maybe it is, but it, it works and, and a lot of the generation that are making decisions now at the companies, they're still believing the face to face. And, We've and actually increased our face to face contact <coughs> uh, in, the, in the last 18 months, much more so. Very unified effort to have more personal contact with our clients. Absolutely. And there, there was just a, a JD Power story that came out June of this month or last month, which is really interesting. It's an auto study, basically going back and looking at the consumers and auto purchasing and how not only do they purchase auto insurance, but what do they want to do with their company or their agent after a purchase is made, changing vehicles interactions. Um, so if you can get a copy of that study, and there's also a management study that goes along with it, it's very telling. Uh, there is a lot more of a movement with customers that they basically want to interact with their company any way they want to is with the bottom line of the, of the stories and there's a lot of statistics. Um, I know the first four months of Travelers in 2011 versus the first four months in 2010, the claims that were submitted to our company tripled uh, with smartphones and we just added Android to that because again consumers are now filing mm -hmm. claims that way. It wasn't that big on commercial lines, it was only about 2% of that increase was on commercial lines but it was 70% for auto, about 25% for property. Um, so again, there is a movement afoot that way. I know a lot of agencies are reaching out using Facebook in really great ways. I talked a little bit earlier about you know cross-selling your accounts and account rounding. I was up for an agent in Western Carolina the week before last, working a referral campaign with them, and they had a really good campaign with the 90 days. They had 143 referrals and brought in 48 new insureds into the agency. And it wasn't just new policies from account, 48 new faces. And I asked them what the key was. They said it was one producer basically in Facebook. And if they'd started another campaign, they already had 105 referrals from Facebook alone just to get people, by word of electronics, interested in their agency and getting a quote and getting coverage from that agency. So it is a powerful force, and I agree with Ray. Face-to-face -face is you know, it's still important. It is relationship. But there's so many different moving parts and so many different studies going on that you need to be involved in, in all various aspects of it. And I know that the companies, like I said, from a claim standpoint, we just added Android for claim reporting. Uh, we just developed some TV advertisement spots that aren't actually for TV, they're actually for agencies to put on Facebook and to put on their website that you actually um, brand your agency at the end of it. And the same thing with what we call an ad creator, you can actually take ads and put them on the same thing. So a lot of it's going electronic fast. Nicole and I had an opportunity um, uh, representing the state of North Carolina's young agents to head out to San Francisco um, in the fall. And uh, there's two individuals that spoke there. Uh, one's an agent out of New York. He's in a family-run agency. He was 25 years old, and he has a blog. The other one, he's a YouTube hero. I mean, he's unbelievable on YouTube. He, he uh, around Valentine's Day, he took a, a, he and his family make it a project, and I'm not recommending you do this, and he said the same, but he put on some Barry White, and he had a camera in there in his bathtub, and he filled it full of bubbles, and he was talking about the discounts that you get if you get married on Valentine's Day on your homeowner's policy. And it was so random and off the chart that he's in Atlanta. I was gonna say it's got Atlanta. Yeah, and it yeah. went it went around town quickly. And people were like, Did you see that guy? And and uh, you know, it was just really funny and he was playing some of the videos and 
it, it's, it's pretty neat to see the difference in generational as you go through it is like you have a group that I'm still, I mean, I'm even an elder when it comes to that stuff. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying what I, I had for, you know, bran flakes in the morning. It's just I don't find that to be important that I ate something and then put it out on the internet. It's just not what I do. But what I learned is that there's a group of people out there that are doing that, and it actually makes you more relatable. Um, you're, if you show that you're not perfect, uh, people come to you like unbelievably in groves. They come to you and say, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. And when they do that, you have every ounce of information about them, who they know, what they know. I mean, I feel like I'm stalking sometimes, you know, like you're stalking someone. I, I go on LinkedIn and I'm looking at everything that, and I go to visit with them, and you talk to them and you can immediately stroke up common element. You don't have to look around the office anymore to find a plaque or a, a, a flag or something that they had signed to say, oh, you have kids, I have kids. You know, you don't have to do that anymore. You know, like, where they went to school, and you probably already know three to four people that they know, and you can go talk to those three to four people that they know and find out even more about them. You know, and uh, we had a gentleman come speak at our sales and leadership conference, maybe last year it was, um, and uh, he said, go out on the website right before you get in on your smartphone and read the press release on the website, their last two press releases of a company. You're going to immediately walk in and say, hey, congratulations on opening the new office in so-and-so. Oh, man, yeah, man, boom. The guy's done. He talks for a half hour on the, the new office they just opened. So, you know, if you're using it to put yourself out there, yeah, I mean, a word of caution, but, you know, I, I think that there's a younger generation out there that I don't think you're going to stop that. I, I think you can say it, and I think that, but it's, it's already there, you know, and half a billion people, I mean, maybe I'll get involved when there's a billion people out there. I don't, I don't know, I but, you know, maybe. maybe. <laughs> but it, it's, it's an absolutely amazingly powerful tool. I'm sitting here saying, like, I use it. The only, the only way I use it is to learn about people. And uh, I need to get better at it. Um, the other agent I thought was a dynamic tool was he would sit in a restaurant. And every business now has their own page. And he specialized in restaurants. So he would take his family out to eat and take a picture of himself in the restaurant and would shoot it to the page of the, and blast it out to everybody has 700 or 800 friends on Facebook. And he would say, you got to check out blah, blah, blah restaurant Tuesday night at, well, who do you think reads that? The owner of the business called him the next day and, or shot him a note back and said, hey, that was incredible. Thank you for doing that. And he said, by the way, do you know what I do? And he's not afraid to ask for it, but he just used it as a tool to get people to come to him. And it, it, outbound marketing, it, what I learned in, in San Francisco, anything outbound is dead. Because you have no idea how much it costs. You can't track it, trace it. Inbound is what's happening. And that's what everybody's doing, is they're using it as an inbound vehicle and they're tracking it through Google Analytics. There's so much information that I, I don't know enough to be dangerous, but I know enough. And, and you're just going to have to stay on it. And the generations coming up are going to be in such an amazing controlling position um, as we go forward. And, and don't sell yourself short if you're a, a whippersnapper, because you're, you're pretty darn intelligent. And that's where the world's going. I believe that's where business is going to happen very shortly. There was a UNC professor that just turned off his email. He said, I, it's dead. And he's teaching people to just use, you know, the social sites to communicate. So could be scary, could be crazy, but, I mean, I believe in that. I think that's, you know, what's happening. And I think it's important to, to reemphasize what Ray said as well. It, it dovetails with his earlier comment about that, that if you're selling a value, your solution, you're trying to solve problems, uh, you can't just do that by having an electronic relationship with somebody. Uh, if you do, then you will become a commodity and a price. And so it is important to, to maintain and use that tool. And Ray's comment was, was exactly right. It, it can be a real strengthening tool. Uh, and I think that's where you find what is the blend, how does your client want to communicate with you, but have it available if they want to. What, what, I, what I don't want to see anyone run into is to sit in an office with someone who says at the end of a really good meeting and they say, hey, I want to connect with you. You on LinkedIn or you on whatever, Twitter, whatever it is. For you to say, you know what, no, I'm not. Or for you to, to say no and, or say, yes, I am, and run home and in the car, you know, get online. But, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just, just be, be prepared for what's coming and be ready, especially since there's really at little to no expense associated with these tools that can strengthen a relationship. Your uh, living room furniture looks awesome. Thank Carl, you. Yeah. You're supposed to do that online, not in my yard. <laughs> I think I need to. Um, real quick. 
And I don't know, Ray, you may know um, if any of your companies are doing it, but George, this is really another question for you. Um, is there, are, are there any plans to do an app for agents to go into? I mean, if I went into a restaurant and, you know, I E net with travelers on commercial lines, it's seven or eight pages of stuff. If I had an app, I could pull up and just ask those questions and answer it right there on my phone or my iPad and just pop a quick quote out kind of thing. Um, or even, and then turn around and go to IENet personal lines and do the homeowners and auto real quick. Is it, have you guys seen anything or heard anything about that? I mean, you're talking about the future, man. If I could have that in my, you know, hip pocket here, I could write some insurance just like that, so. Yeah. Let me go first. I, I think that's coming. Again, I think that's part of the studies you're seeing with, uh, again, the report that just came out from JD Power, and I think there's a lot of companies that probably have people working on that. I know we've got people at, at our company that are also looking at that and working with new processes, new ways to produce policies, new ways to issue things. So um, we're not there yet, but I know there's people that are looking into that. And a little bit of point of what Eric was talking about, when you, when you have Google sites or when you collect a lot of data, we're very good at collecting that type of data and have been for a couple of years. So there's a lot of information streaming into our home office with certain groups of people that are basically slicing and dicing that information and trying to figure out you know, what the easiest way is to do something, what the next approach is to do something. That is great if I got that in my No, not, I haven't. Not, not, uh, not this working viable product at this point. Just out of curiosity, let's have a little survey since we're turning this panel around a little bit. Uh, raise your hand if you're on Facebook currently. <laughs> All right, hands down. Raise your hand if you're on Twitter. <laughs> Hands down. And LinkedIn. So very few people not connected uh, online. And so not only from a uh, standpoint of your potential clients and your current clients, but also from a professional standpoint of advice and uh, who's out there that maybe you could go to to look for that mentorship, uh, who's involved in an industry or an area that you're trying to get into. So I think it has a lot of, a lot of really good, useful things. Any questions out there from the audience? Let me raise a point to the panel. Uh, paperless. Let's have a little discussion there. Many agencies are along a different spectrum uh, when it comes to paperless, um, from not paperless to paperless. And so uh, if you could share with us from your company's perspective your experience, kind of maybe where you are on the paperless spectrum. Uh, and then the advantages that you found from, from where you are or where you're headed, what you're hoping to experience. We'll start at the end. We're going there just as fast as we possibly can. The one thing that we realized that when you do paperless in stages, it can be confusing because you have some products that you no longer issue, some you still do. And in the brokerage uh, world, it's, it's, there's no way that I know around it because you don't control your markets and some aren't where you are in the stream. So wherever we can, we're paperless. And it, I mean, it saves you so much. Just personnel costs, printing costs, trees, postage, the whole nine yards. Um, it's just, you know, you don't have to build more buildings, no more bricks and mortar. But my concern for the brokerage side is getting some of the markets that we deal with to do the same thing. But the, the, pro, the paper that we control, we, we have eliminated. I think I'd, we're about where uh, I would say J&J &J is. We, there's some that are, there's some that aren't. You, you have to ebb and flow as an agent, but um, primarily we're a paperless environment. Um, don't look at my desk, but, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, or the floor, or under the floor. Or, no. <laughs> Um, but it's, you know, it, it is an absolute tool um, to be able to log in, grab things on the go, and, and get it on the fly. It, it, it's where it has to be. Um, we're in that middle environment, so it's, it's a little bit challenging because, you know, you're, you're managing 50 different uh, providers and partners, so uh, not everybody's on the same page. Yeah, we, we turned off paper and personal lines back June of last year, actually, so it's been a year. Um, there's still some things that are manuscripted, uh, basically with our agencies, either through the agency management system or through a login with our agency HQ, you can get copies of the documents. And to Dashiell's point, it's much more efficient. It saves you a lot of time from a company standpoint, the storage alone. I mean, not having to store that paper. 
is a, makes a big difference. And, and I found it's just as easy to go out and pull up the document if I need it. Most times I don't. So it, it's a saver for all of us. Ditto for us. I think uh, you know a lot of it's out of our control. I think that's the best way to say. Um, you know, paperless to me sometimes when we look on the desk and look in the floor, it's a little bit of a cliche. But um, you know, we're as paperless as we can be. But as long as there are brokers, form Fs, uh, government papers, whatever that want the wedding signature, you got to print it. You got to do it. You're not paperless. So will we ever get completely 100% paperless? Probably not in my lifetime, um, but where we can be, I think we will. And, and you're right, we have done away with our file storage. We have no file storage in our agency. Uh, in fact, there was a project uh, just a couple months ago where the old stuff that was there, we boxed it up, we put it in archives, um, and everything that comes in now is scanned and it's online. But uh, again, there's always paper generated because somebody else wants it from you. Can I ask the audience, is there anyone in here that is not on an agency management system? Is there anyone that does not have a computerized system for your office? So you still doing doing it by paper files? And how's that working for you? <laughs> <laughs> Must be working. Are you considering a change or I asked that question for a reason, because I knew there would, there would be somebody. Everybody, I think, assumes that everybody's computerized with their agency management system. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's one of your very active members who's not, and he, he, is, he does survive. And as, as he said, didn't sound to me, he's racing to talk to George Robertson that back in the back to get it done tomorrow. So I think we sometimes lose sight. It might be, you might be missing the mark. Maybe it's where you are, you can do it, where you couldn't in Charlotte. But uh, there, are, there are many agents out there that still file and retrieve, file and retrieve. The only thing that scares me about that is how in the hell do you make sure you don't miss renewals? You depend on George, right? Okay. And, and kind of following on that too, if, you, if maybe you could share from uh, your perspective what, as you've gone paperless and have, or at least are pushing in that direction, what the reaction has been from either your customers or your partners. I think from a customer basis, um, a, a lot of industry is already there. Yeah. Uh, we're playing catch up and I, I get some funny looks. We're in an in Raleigh, you have a, a highly technical, technological area, and you know they can't believe that you're still using it. Um, it depends upon, you know, where you're at. But it's, uh, you know, it, it uh, it's a necessary evil. I mean, we we got to get there. Other other industries, are, that's what our competition is, and um, you know, it's just where it's at. I've yeah. actually had. Uh customers ask me when will I get the policy binders that we all deliver. Right. We all say we're paperless, we're not. What are you taking this to the client um, in a three ring binder? Uh, but they want, they're looking for them on CDs now. And uh, What's that? Know, the, the policies. No, a CD. I do oh. think we might, be, we might be close to the day where an agency that is not on an agency management system will not be able to contract with new carriers. I think carriers will acquire that. And that uh, it'll hurt you on the marketing side, Harry, is where I think going forward is going to be the issue. Yeah, I've always wondered what the, it's kind of the security blanket for a lot of people to have a handhold on their three ring binder. So I was just curious how your clients respond to that. Any questions from the audience at this point? I, I think just what Eric said is true because I know uh, from a policy standpoint and personal lines, a lot of folks, if you have, a lot of companies have sites that they have set up where you can go in and log in with a password and ID and review your own policy and file a claim and make payments. So uh, that J.D. Power study report I was just referring to from last month talked a little bit about the insurance industry and how far behind we are other industries in our technology. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty staggering when you look at some of the statistics they put out there. So again, back to your point, Eric, a lot of the consumers may think we're there and we're not. Mm -hmm. Because of everything else that they do transactions with, those companies are a little bit ahead of us still. Yeah, I think some of the reaction that, that we have seen from the paperless is, is that um, gosh, we, we get everything else paperless. So, yeah, yeah, if you could finally deliver that paperless, that'd be helpful. So, just some encouragement there for yeah. those that are going through. Because the transition is not uh, easy or fun at times. Um, things but, get you know, we, we still deal with legal contracts. Mm -hmm. And last time I checked, 
lawyers would rather charge you for a fancy looking document to sign than they would to hand you a CD. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of tied to the legal community too. <coughs> Some of that makes us a staid industry. On the, as you're looking at the market today, what, what types of policies are you seeing a trend towards things that are being written now that weren't written 12 months ago, or 18 months ago, maybe any energy about them? Um, We're writing a lot more technology, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really picked up pace, I think, Josh. And EPL, he's writing a lot more EPL than we've seen. That's the two biggest things I would think in the past 12 months. For, for me, it's been uh, the education for both myself and to my client base of cyber or internet liability, whichever word you want to term. Um, and the first and third party exposures that are out there, the identity theft exposures, um, it, it's, it's rampant. And, and part, of, uh, part of the development of the social networking and putting everything mm -hmm. online and the PDAs and the smartphones and everything we carry today, that's driving. That's driving this because, uh, you know, as, as Short a time ago as you know, just a few years, uh, you didn't you didn't hear of these type of claims necessarily, um, and when they did, they were few and far between, and the, a lot of the federal guidelines weren't in place as far as who, where the responsibilities were and that sort of thing. Um, that's totally turned now, and uh, certainly there was not a policy, um, there was no no coverage available uh, until I'm guessing roughly about 18 months ago now. And now a lot of carriers are starting to come out with. Travelers has got a product. Uh, uh, many of the carriers out there do. Westfield and, uh, you know, so Chubbs and CNAs. And, and so if you're not talking to your customers, if you're dealing commercial any, in any capacity and you're not talking to your customer base about uh, cyber or Internet liability, you really need to focus on that. Mm -hmm. The personal lines, it's interesting you mention that because industry-wide or company-wide, I should say, from our standpoint, uh, our biggest growth last year in sales was identity fraud and expense reimbursement coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, grew over 9%. And I believe there were 11 million uh, cases of identity theft reported in the United States in 2009. So that goes hand in hand with what's going on and what you read in the paper. Back to your point, Ray, mm -hmm. when you read about someone being compromised and people um, having their identity stolen. I just know in the last couple of weeks we enhanced that coverage. I was out talking to a few agents and it turned from two to six to seven where the agents themselves have had, had had their identity stolen just in the last probably 15 business days that I've hmm. So that's been our biggest increase uh, that I'm aware of. Somebody else here? Let's talk for a minute, uh, and I know we don't have any um, employee benefits specialists on the panel, but if you could share what you're hearing from business owners or what if your agency is working in that arena, uh, anything about the health care legislation and the effect it's had, at least on their businesses to this point. I think when I speak to folks about it, they're, they seem to be paralyzed. Um, they don't want to change. They don't know what's coming. Uh, every day there's a different story in the news, uh, a lot of fear tactics. Uh, we developed a, a benefits division about two years ago, three years ago, uh, brought a gentleman in, he, he did very well um, rounding out accounts, it, it just made sense uh, not having it rather than outsourcing it to a, a third party and uh, from speaking with him um, you have to have a certain level of volume, commissions have been reduced, uh, he's delivering you know increase after increase in one of the worst economic environments, uh, he used to weigh 300 pounds, he's down to about a buck fifty now um, they just he's gotten beat up uh, with that piece but um, I've, we've had conversations about him and and myself and and just saying to him you're so valuable right now because people are they have a, a thirst for knowledge in that arena and they need somebody to come in that knows how to navigate that piece and so you know he's been quite active uh, again it's difficult to make people change their relationship because they're really afraid of doing that and thinking that something's going to happen um, a lot of fear tactics, but, but that's what I'm hearing and seeing from our benefits division. And although I don't do employee benefits, I tag along. We also have a division and we pair up and uh, I'm out quite frequently with one of our employee benefit uh, uh, folks. And uh, so I just listen. Um, and, and uncertainty is the biggest question right now. Um, obviously there's a, a lot of changes that uh, are implemented in, uh, in, in the, uh, the health care revisions. Um, many of them targeted for 2013, 14, and beyond. Um, but then again, there's the uncertainty, the changeover uh, in the House of Representatives, 
um, what's coming in the, the future presidential elections, which Eric mentioned earlier. Um, the Senate, uh, there's just a lot of uncertainty as to how this is going to be. As we all know, the House is already uh, trying to repeal uh, what's there now, and they do uh, control the financing. Um, so I think there's going to be you know, a lot of question and uncertainty over the next couple of years and, until we settle down on, on what this thing's finally going to look at. And I think that, you know, just from what little I know about it, um, there are some good things that were passed, and then there were some things that, that were not so good and thrown in. So I think it's, it's going to be a lot of, uh, I think we're going to be talking about this for a lot of years to come. Mm -hmm. Anything from the audience? We have one here. Yeah. Did anybody hear that? I think the question was um, wanting to know their opinion on whether Social Security will actually be there or not, uh, which is something that they hear a lot in their generation. And is that a scare tactic or is that a reality? So we're looking for an opinion from the panel. Mathematically, it's possible, yes. Yeah. It is possible. Although I don't know that the federal government will ever allow that to happen, although mathematically you're correct. I agree, but I mean, it is possible. Oh, uh, agree. So much more money to get from China. Or... Yes, correct. And, and I think yeah. one, one of the things on, on that point as well, as, as maybe even with health care, is that these are questions that I think we all get asked, regardless of whether we're in that industry or whether that's our expertise. But when you sit down with a business owner and talk about insurance, you know, they, they see us as an agent, as an insurance person. Uh, all insurance. And so I'm sure many of us have gotten those questions, whether it's our specialty or not. And so as a, as a student coming into the industry, to, to have someone, if your specialty is personal lines or it's commercial lines, uh, to have a person you can go to, to that, is, that is an expert in that area that can help you with answers for, for that person when they ask. Think. That one's a little bit, that one's a little bit out there. I mean, yeah. probably the best thing to say is, okay, it's going to be in the hands of a room full of elected people. Now, how secure do you feel? <laughs> and, one, and one way to have security there is to, is to be involved in that process. PAC. PAC for one, and, and more importantly, being voted. Yep, Eric. What a lead in. Another hand up. Yep. Nancy. Not fair for you to ask the question. <laughs> heard a lot about other industry um, things today. Tell me what you expect. You know, what's going to wow you on the service side when you're dealing with the carriers? Ease of doing business, responsiveness, knowledge. You know, when I'm dealing with underwriters, I, uh, I need someone who can realize that there's 30 questions they'd like to know, but they can really make an informed decision on 15. And to cut it down to those 15 um, and get to the point of the heart of what they need to know. Um, someone who will take a little initiative. There's a lot of resources out there to even do a little investigative uh, uh, uncovery on, on the company itself, in my case. Um, and then I need an underwriter who's knowledgeable um, and who will, within company parameters, try to get out of the box. Everything seems to be in this square, and everything's not in that square in this business. And when you're willing to step outside of the square and look for an innovative solution, that's what we're trying to deliver to our clients. So if we've got an underwriter who can help us with an innovative solution, that's exactly what we're there for, and that's how we win the business and we deliver to that, that underwriter that comes through. We believe that service is so important, it comes first. We have a service standard, and anybody with J&J &J wants to stand, somebody stand up and tell them what a service standard is. M by two, response by five. Everybody in the company knows what it is. That's how important we, we measure service. If it's above price, it's above everything else. And that is important, you know, internally on the carrier side, but is it meeting or exceeding your expectations on the agency side? Me, um, for him or for me? Eric. For Eric. I, I mean, on the, we do best, all I can speak to is what I know, and, and <coughs> We do best with the carriers that, you know, people say get it, but, you know, and Ray's talking about commoditization, sticking you in a box. I mean, 
you know, when they know something about you. Um, when they come into your agency and they know your account managers on a personal level, um, it means a lot back to relationship we talk about. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, groups that are cutting back on that because of the economy, about also to the client. Uh, with the tornadoes that we just had, um, we had a lot of independent adjusters coming out and not carrier representatives uh, or representatives of that specific carrier. And it was, I, I, there, we had 200 claims in three days hit us and, and all, all of them were approached by independent adjusters that potentially are coming in from other states and just know an ISO form or don't know. So, I mean, service to our client, which is our client being the, the end user or holder of that policy is, is utmost important, but from an internal basis, just knowing that you can call somebody and, and get the answer you need quickly, or you can get to that person <clears throat> as fast as you need to get to it, and they're there to answer and get back with you when they say they're going to get back to you. And you're just not, you know, shuffled into, oh, well, we have to send you off to this. That, that to me, is just doesn't float. Uh, we do very poorly with uh, that situation where we're stuck in, and we just don't have a, a person or we're thrown into a pool. It, it never works. And I think, too, Dashiell, on your in by two, out by five, it, it, it does sound simple, but as many of us know, uh, those kind of things don't happen every day. And in the world of technology that we're in with immediate feedback and response, uh, tools that we've never had before that would enable us to do that, uh, yet it still doesn't get done in a lot of cases. And so I think that to, to keep it simple and to be responsive, as Ray said, is, is a real, uh, not only for our carrier partners, but also uh, for our fellow workers and professionals that we're around, and also for the insureds. I mean, being responsive quickly, we have all those tools to do so, and, and for us to do that with our clients who demand immediate response, we have to have partners that can help us act on that. So thanks for sharing that. Anything else on the carrier side? We talked a little bit about value selling and pricing, and there's always the challenge between understanding for an insured of the coverage and then the ability to actually purchase the coverage needed. And so whether it's commercial or personal lines, if you could just share with us what you're seeing, what we hear sometimes is, I understand that I need it, I don't have the ability, and in this economy that makes it very difficult. So if you could maybe share how those discussions go and, and how you help them to move to a point of finding the ability to get the coverage that they need. I'll speak to that, I guess. Um, a lot of folks are, you know, the term consultative selling, uh, you know, anytime you bring up selling, it, it people shut down. but. Um, when, you, when you're trying to present a, like a professional line, an errors and emissions policy, no, no, nobody says, I need that. Everybody's like, I don't, I don't need that. I'm, I'm not going to make a mistake. But if you put it into their terminology of their business, if you show them how long it would take them to recover, or it might even close their doors, if you run the gamut and put it into their words, how many more widgets do they have to sell to cover the increased cost of that claim? or of that exposure, uh, if it were to happen or if it did happen. And if you can drill it down into an individual business owner's language, speaking finance, speaking about whatever it is that they do and relate, it's really dynamic and powerful. But if you come in and just try to sell them something that you read on an ad slick and say everybody needs this, I think you, they turn a blind eye pretty quickly or glaze over if you're not you know, relating to that individual uh, speaking in his terms. Yeah, I, agree. I agree and, and, and would further that to say that I believe that if you take a true risk management approach, um, a lot of it's going to sell itself. And what do I mean by risk management approach? So many people come in again and, you know, they've got the coverage slicks from the carrier. They're nice guys. Don't stop developing them. They're good. They give you the claim scenarios. But that really doesn't motivate the buyer to buy the cyber liability or the directors and officers or EPL. Um, I related, and I've never sold life insurance, but I related a little bit to maybe thinking about when I buy life insurance, can I afford to buy a million dollar policy? Well, the question is, can I afford not to because of what I've got to leave the burden to my loved ones? And so again, I think you've got to relate it to uh, whatever the particular, whether it's professional or cyber liability, um, protecting the assets of the company. Um, what are they going to do if this occurs? Can their balance sheet support that loss without this insurance. Um, and a lot of times, um, if they don't want to pay $10,000 for a, a policy, 
um, a professional policy uh, with a $10,000 deductible? Do you want to insure a million dollar professional policy with a $50,000 deductible that brings the price down to $7,000? Um, there, there are ways to do this, but again, I think if you walk through the risk management process of identifying the exposures, analyzing the exposures, looking at retentions and the way you're going to finance, uh, and, and what's left is what really needs to be insured. If you can educate, in my world, the commercial buyers as to insuring for the catastrophic, what, what's going to put you out of business? Um, then you really are going to be able to, a lot, of, a lot of these products are going to sell themselves. And I try to let them sell themselves um, rather than seem like the pushy used car sales because none of us like that. Yeah, I think, I think that's the right approach too for personal lines. It's consultative selling, it's listening. Uh, a lot of folks that do sell personal lines, you know you probably have the line before that when you do review a policy, if you're talking to someone over the phone, they'll say I've got a BI slash PD and then they just tell you what the numbers are because they don't even know what that means. Uh, but to talk to them about what the importance of underinsured motorists, uninsured motorist coverage, excess liability, uh, breaking things down into manageable pieces. I mean, I've, I've learned in this state, you typically can, can buy your home insurance and your auto insurance. It costs you probably about as much as your cable and internet bill a month. And, and that's what I've told the people before. You know, it's, it's 86 bucks a month. You know, you're paying 120 for your internet and cable. I mean, you know, you're talking about insuring your assets and, and your family. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that usually hits home with them pretty well. But the first thing is, again, if you don't like to sell, be an educator. Because you're all licensed and professional, and at least let the people know what they're missing. What, you know, paint some pictures for them. Yeah. There's all types of scenarios you can paint pictures that it's not a scare tactic, it's true things about things that happen in the paper every day that uh, you can relate to personal lines and property damage and liability. I agree, Jordan. I tell my, my clients, listen, it's not my decision to tell you what to buy. It's my, it's, it's my place, it's my position, it's what you hired me to do to help you know all of the potential exposures for your organization. And we talk about the exposures, we assess them, and you make the decision, um, but it's my job to inform you about mm -hmm. it. Thank you. All right, audience, this is your last call for questions. I've got one last one. Oh, good. Here we go. Uh, right here, you got Absolutely so. Um, for many years, I tried to be the generalist, and uh, and in my book of business, I still write not every class of business, but a, a wide variety. But probably 70% of my book of business is construction, um, and I think uh, once you become ingrained in a particular industry, one that you understand, one that you can set yourself above a lot of the other folks out there, or differentiate yourself. Uh, among a lot of the other generalists out there, I think you're going to bring a lot to the table. Um, there's a lot of good agents out there that dabble in construction. And no offense to any of them, but if you don't understand you know, anti-indemnity laws in various states, if you can't talk, hold harmless indemnification agreements, if you can't look at a contract and know how to give feedback, uh, not from an attorney standpoint, but how insurance interacts with that contract, then you know, and that just doesn't mean, when I say if you can't look at it, that doesn't mean, yes, we can do that, 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 and that. Yeah, you might be able to do it, but you know what your client's given up. If a client's saying, I need this certificate with a waiver of subrogation on the work comp, fine, we might get the carrier to do that. Do you really understand what that means? Do you know what you're giving up when you do a waiver? Are you having those kind of informed, educated, detailed risk management discussions? Because if you're not, you're just a generalist. It's easier, I think to specialize in the bigger shops and the bigger urban areas. It's much difficult, more difficult for Harry Bray, for example, in Providence, North Carolina, to specialize in anything because he services the need of a small community mm -hmm. and the surrounding area, right Harry? So, but yet inside of that, I know another agent who lives in a very small town, he's in this room, and he specializes specifically on one thing. And his agency is very, very good at ensuring that one type of industrial operation. So it can happen as well in a small community. I think it's just tougher for Keith on the coast. You're going to specialize in beach property. <laughs> That's about as special as it's going to get for you. So 
But that's specialized because if I went well, to the beach property, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it isn't. That's all there is there. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's easier in um, in a metropolitan area like Charlotte or Raleigh or Winston Salem or Greensboro to have the opportunity to seek that out. And then there are some agencies like Ascend Dunn who have hung their hat on a lot of specialty things, operations, and they hired to that. So it also works in that way. But do you see your travel base expand being a specialist? So you're not just Charlotte Metro, right? Say again. Your travel base because you're a specialist, you've expanded past Charlotte Metro? Western North Carolina. Western. Because I've seen that there's a lot of commercial persons that also sell personal lines, and for the younger ones that I've come across, they are specialists. <laughs> Um, I was with a gentleman last week, and they basically go from Winston-Salem to Raleigh. Um, you know, so we'll leave at 4.30 in the morning, get over to Raleigh, do our thing, be in Greensboro the next day. So because they're specialists, they do have to expand their footprint. Yeah. It, it, true, and, and, and I'll give you an example. We've got a producer out of our BB&T Statesville office, um, and he's, he's known throughout the country for his specialization in health care. And he goes from coast to coast, and that's what he does. Um, and that's the niche he got in. So, yeah, yeah it, it can depend. But for my little world of construction, there's plenty there's from plenty Charlotte West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just would, would add that, um, I mean, you have to be cautious when you specialize because you see these dips and swings. You have to pick something that uh, is stable. But, I mean, a lot of times you can't, you can't determine that. I, I think when you specialize, anytime you see somebody that's passionate about whatever it is that they do, uh, it comes through and, and people gravitate towards that. I, I know Carl does a lot of manufacturing because he has a background in that and that it, it, I can only imagine, I mean I saw a YouTube video where you were standing in front of a, a press or some industrialized machine all osha would up, you know, you had your PPE and glasses. I'm on it, man. But um, that goes a long way because you know that that guy is immediately going to know that he's speaking my language, he knows what I'm doing and I feel that you ha in our industry you kind of have to in some sense because of you know, we'll call it adult ADD. I leave the office at the end of the day and got like 50 windows open, and I'm like, did I do that again? You know, I got on 100 things. There's so many ways you can get pulled. It just gives you that level of focus and determination. And, you know, you can join trades and you can get on with the trade shows, but you can really, you know, get these folks to just start talking, and the word travels quite quick when they found that specialist. And it could be, you could be a general specialist. I mean, it, there's so many different ways to coin a. Uh, a specialist, but um, but it is easier for me personally. We've done it. We have a self storage program, a public school work comp program, and we started to get into some public entity and municipalities, and and it's worked quite well. Um, we've targeted some of the uh, the folks that have uh, chaired or served on levels of committees within those associations, and you know when they speak, people follow, and it, it's just you know uh, that kind of strategy. But it, you can crash and burn pretty quickly when that when that goes south, if you have so much, uh, you know, you got to diversify a little bit. So. As, a, as a guy who specialized in textile manufacturing companies uh, prior to my insurance business, that's why I'm in the insurance business, so there is a word of caution when you specialize. Uh, <laughs> textile manufacturing was paying all my bills for about uh, three years and then they all left the country and I couldn't go with them, so there is a little bit of caution there. Uh, but I do think the points are very valuable and valid on uh, specialization, and, and, to, and Ray mentioned it too. Um, specialist sometimes doesn't mean necessarily that small niche. Eric just said it. If you're a generalist and you're really good at it, you can be a specialist at writing all businesses. So, so it really is how you position yourself and what you, what you get your expertise in. Do we have one more question out here before we cl Yeah. an agency being able to be automated and get real-time data and frequently easily be able to communicate with the customer in several different mediums. Uh, you know, talking to a lot of different agencies, especially in the independent side, uh, they almost have an, an approach for the brick and mortar, you know, building and the customer will come. Uh, I just wanted to hear your opinion on whether or not you think that's a, a dying trend and there's going to be more room for I guess to be more of a, a, for lack of a better word, a virtual agency, more sales oriented. And do you see that being a trend within the independent insurance? It, it's already here. We have an agent that's, um, or he actually has a setup in a mortgage broker off, bro brokerage office. Um, very high tech. He works about three days a week. It makes a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And um, he has one assistant, and that's it. So that, that, that's, already, that's already here. The brick and mortar guys, 
you're looking at you're looking at one of them, maybe another one. Um, that's the old the old man. Not as bad as banks. Now banks are the worst in the world about building. They will come, but I, that's already here. I, I I think even us old guys realize that building a monument to yourself ain't going to get nobody in the front door anymore. And I think, uh, you know, the, the days of the direct rider, personal lines, and George, you talked a little bit about that. But from my perspective, my office is my car. It's my phone. It's wherever I've got a laptop and I can sit down. Yeah, I've got an office and I've got a staff. I need to show up once in a while just to let them know I'm still breathing and that I'm not on the golf course all the time, which is hardly ever. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've got an office at home. I've got an office in my car. I've got an office here in Charlotte. I've got an office in Morganton. And, and, but, but really where I am is out with my customers. I go back to that face-to-face. -face. You know, the clients I'm dealing with, they need that face-to-face. -face. Um, whether I'm doing claim reviews, whether I'm out doing stewardship reports, whether I'm out doing loss control visits, um, or, or educating them through coverage reviews or, or pre-renewals or whatever it is. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, I mean, I'm a virtual agent. I've got a place I can go, but our rule is if I'm in there more than 15 to 20 percent of the time, I'm not doing my job. I need to be out. And that's hard to get those office folks to understand because the producer's doors are always closed and you're always gone. They're always out on the golf course. Well, I'd like to shoot whoever told me 20 years ago that if I became an agent, I could, you know, work three days a week and play golf because <laughs> it don't happen. We're uh, getting ready to end our panel. Our time is up. I would like to go down and let everybody have an opportunity on the panel to just uh, real quickly offer one last parting shot of advice, uh, not only to the agents and the students that are in the audience, uh, but just, just some, something from your life lessons that you want to share with us as we go. Ray. My life lesson, I said it earlier, I love this career, I love this job, I love what I do every day. I wake up, I realize that I've got an opportunity to help somebody. Um, it's not about me. For me, this is not a self-serving job. Um, I've got a lot of credentials behind my name. I tell folks that and two dollars will get you a cup of coffee if you're not at Starbucks. But, uh, you know, I just, I really have a passion for helping people and helping them be successful. Um, I, I really love it. And, uh, you know, the other thing is for you younger producers, again, learn how to pre-qualify, learn how to build those relationships, learn how to bring your hit ratios up from the industry average of 10 or 15 or 20 percent up into the 50, 60, 70 percent range because that's where you really make a difference when, you know, the, the shots you're taking are ones that matter, not just because you're doing a, a quote check for someone against another agent. Yeah, I, my parting shot, I guess, would be sometimes the, the simplest things are the most fun things. And I, and I know the people that, that I work with that report to me and that I report to get sick of, of the story, but um, when I entered the industry, I did come in as personal line sales and my first job was an account rounding position and for me that was probably the most rewarding because I was actually, actually able to talk to clients of an agency that I was put into work and it was a great learning lesson because that's really, really, I really learned at a young age you know, how poorly some of this coverage is written and I'm sure from a commercial standpoint you guys run across this a lot and, um, and I know I said it earlier but I think if you've got a passion, if you want to talk to people, if you want to educate them it's extremely fulfilling and rewarding when you think you've really help somebody that for years or over years maybe a vet has been inadequately covered and you've been able to show them you know what's important or point out what's important to them for their, their fact finding and um, you know I think it's a great industry to be in I love working with independent agents I think it's a great career to go independent uh, there was some mention before about some of the actions of direct writers and what's going on in the state and uh, my first job at a company one of the guys that came in with in sales used to own a used to be a direct writer and he told me the story about he specialized in, in one thing commercially and they took it away. It was in North Carolina. I was living in Virginia. Then he moved to another area and they took that away. And now he owns an agency out in Durham. But um, it's a great industry. It's a tight industry. And, um, you know, just enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. Stuart, which camera is the best? No. Uh, the, uh, the one thing I can say is, is a lot of folks think that the Independent Insurance Association is time ill spent in the sense of oh I, why would I want to get involved and it's a you know I need to be out right in business um, I'm so thankful that I work for an agency that supports the the big eye uh, here in North Carolina we've we've launched a program that North Carolina agents support I never thought in a billion years that I'd be having agents come to a program that we created and we're helping them out uh, and the only way I did that 
with a, a group of folks was through this association. I, I've gotten to meet some of the greatest people. So my plug for the young agents, uh, for uh, you know, elder agents, experienced agents, whatever you want to say, um, you need to be involved in this group of people because there's some unbelievably dynamic folks that come to these events and you are getting free information that you would pay a consultant thousands of dollars for and you're wasting your money I don't mean to if anybody's a consultant on the side you moonlight I don't know. <laughs> but but absolutely get involved here get involved with this group um, and if you're not that's fine I mean I'm I get it but there's a group of people that I have met that you know you say it it's where I mean you create lifelong friends and I've been able to create some really dynamic relationships and it, it's worked so you know next time that registration form goes out pass it out to some folks. Um, it'd be amazed that, you know, it'll change your life. Uh, I promise you that. Well, I kind of spoke my piece before, but I'll tell you that my, my best friends, my personal, personally, my best friends are insurance agents, people that I do, have done business with. And I left the industry, the private sector. I went in the public sector. I had the, I went as high as I could without being elected, but I never really left the agency side. I mean, I always missed it and I came back to it. it. Took me a few years to get politics and all that junk out of my head, but when I did, I came right back, <laughs> came right back to where I belong. And so, if you, if you get in this business, you'll know, if, it, if the bug bites you, you'll know it. And you won't leave it. Not for long. Thank you, Nash. Will you join me in uh, thanking our panel? <laughs>